Hi, welcome to Cross Point Community Church. I'm Brandon. And I'm Nathaniel, and this is what you need to know this week. If you're a first time guest and you're wondering what we're all about, our mission here at Cross Point is to lead people to be passionate followers of Christ. If you were wondering what those boxes were when you walked in, back there, that's Tom. It stands for ties, offerings, and missions. And this is how we take offering here at Cross Point. Want to see how animals eat their food? Watch closely. Starting next week on April 28th, we're going to have We Believe. It's a session that will take place after the second service. And during the session, we're just going to be talking about our beliefs and values as a church. Students, tonight we got student takeover starting at 6 o'clock. You can come out at 5.15 for some pizza and hangout time. But since we have musical today, well, the high school students have musical, we're going to be playing just games. Well, today we continue on with our series, This is How We Changed the World, with part three. Well, that's all we got need to know this week. If you have any questions, stop by the welcome table on your way out, or you can visit our website, crosspointonline.net, where you can check out our app. Don't forget to drop your offering into Tom on your way out. And that's all we got for you this week. Here's a brief recap. Good morning, Cross Pointers. You're wondering about that, aren't you, the Cross Pointers? Yeah. Where's my Cross Pointer uh, helper? Justin. Oh, there you go. All right, so we, uh, you know me, I'm all about being serious all the time. So we have a new secret Cross Point handshake, okay? So I wanted to show you this, so it goes along with the Cross Pointers thing. So you come up to a fellow Cross Pointer, put your hand out, they put their other hand out. You make your church symbol, and then it's also a cross pointer. And James Bond kind of thing, too. So I know that doesn't even touch the how, you're, how the animals eat your food thing. I know. It doesn't come up close. So. But you will have to be able to do that when you go to the welcome table later if you're new. That's the only way that you'll actually be able to get brownies delivered to your house. So I'm sorry. No, in all seriousness, we're here today. Our mission here at Cross Point, and I would say our desire here is to lead people to be passionate followers of Christ. If you are a first-time guest, we do encourage you to go out to the welcome table, and uh, you won't be served with brownies, but we would like to get a little bit of information from you, um, just your name and phone number, um, and maybe your email address. Uh, today is the third part of our series, How We Change the World. The title of it is Trades, so if that gets you all stimulated mentally, that would be great, so just wait for that coming up. Uh, the We Believe series is next week, if you're interested in that. It is a 30-minute um, uh, session right after the service. It uh, is more about how we develop uh, our faith. And also, if you're very interested in baptism, that's where we would encourage you to go uh, in order to, uh, one, sign up probably to be baptized, as well as learn more about that if you're interested in that. And then, um, oh, one more thing. Today is church elections. If you are 15 or older and are a church partner, um, which is what we call membership here at Cross Point. Uh, we would encourage you to vote. The station is back in by the bathrooms in the hallway. 
and uh, we are electing our guardians, which is also the, uh, what we call our board here. So uh, if you are a partner, we encourage you to vote today. And is that on next week too? No, oh, this week and next week. And this is the first time we've had guardians, and uh, we are officially organized as a church at this time. So that's kind of exciting too. Let's stand up, shake hands, get ready for worship, and make sure you get your other hand out to do the cross point secret handshake. Uh, so today we are talking about, uh, we're continuing our series, This is How We Change the World. And if I could just get, take a little bit of time just to set this up. Um, last week, if you were with us, um, we did something that I've never done. Um, I've kind of been speaking regularly for about seven years now. And it's the first time that I just kind of went, okay, what I've got doesn't work. Let's do something else. And um, I am not anticipating that that will become a regular thing. So um, that's happened once in seven years, so if you want it to happen again, um, come back in 2020, and we may shake things up again. But uh, just to be clear, so we're going to continue our series, This is How We Change the World. Uh, last week, we were going to talk about responsibility. Um, we did that in the 915 service. You guys missed that because we did something else. Um, we're not going to go back and cover that. That message is just kind of lost in message heaven or wherever messages go when they die. <laughs> If somebody comes up with a good idea of where messages go when they die, then you let me know that. Could be seminary, but I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> that was good. I felt, I felt good about that. <laughs> I like that, right then. <laughs> so, anywho, uh, today we're continuing our series, This is How We Change the World, with part three. Today we're talking about making trades throughout this whole series. We've been talking about how do you make an impact. You say that you, we've said that you have to be a leader to make an impact. So that's why we're talking about leadership, because leadership is how impacts are made, how things become different, how changes happen in the world. But the big thing is, do you want to make an impact? And that's the question that we've been asking throughout the series. Do you want to make an impact? And, and the problem is, and it's worked well with what we've covered so far in terms of fear and responsibility in the first service last week. Uh, but the problem is, is that question is kind of the wrong question question, that, that it's not exactly, exactly right in terms of making an impact. Because, um, and, and we're going to do a quick poll, and just to be clear on this, um, I ask you to raise your hand a lot, like I'll go, who thinks this? And um, I feel like there's a good 40% of us that have had rotator cuff surgery every week, because our arms just can't possibly go up. And so, if you have rotator cuff surgery, you are, you are exempt from this right now. Um, but for the rest of us, who would say that, yes, I want to make an impact in my life? Could we? There we go. I mean, good. Less of us have. That's good. Allison? Yeah, I saw that that was not so good. That's fantastic. She used her other arm. In a sling, used her other arm. Very well done. Um, so, yeah, we would say we want to make an impact. We want to make a difference. We want to make a change. But, but the problem is, is that the desire to make an impact does not mean necessarily that you will make an impact in your life. Um, to give you an easy example, um, I got an opportunity uh, a couple weeks ago. I love doing this. Um, every year in the middle school and the high school, they have kids take a test. Um, and the test is like, this is what I like. These are the things that I enjoy. And then it gives them possible career tracks that they would take in their life. And so they'll come out, and at the end, there's like five possible career tracks that they could possibly take. Um, and so I, I'm doing this. Well, let me share one story of a student who is my favorite student in the history of the world right now. Because last year when I did this, he came up to me, and uh, one of the things on his test was a welder. And so I was like, well, are there any of these that you think you want to do? Yeah, I'm going to be a welder. I was like, and he's like, oh, seventh, eighth grade? And I was like, wow, the, the confidence in this student that he was going to be a welder just kind of, it kind of threw me off. I was like, so, so you're for sure. Oh, yeah, I've, been, I've wanted to be a welder since I was two. I was like. Well, this is just news to me. I've never seen someone who they're like complete, they nothing else. So it's like, okay, so we talked about welding, which I learned lots because I know nothing about welding. And so I'm like, I got to the very end of it and I go, well, if for some reason the welding thing doesn't work out, do you have a backup option? Yeah, I'm going to be a country music singer. <laughs> well, now that's a tandem that I haven't really seen much, but very... I, he's like, I may do both. I was like, more power to you, buddy. That is fantastic. Um, so when I was doing this a couple weeks ago, uh, I sit down with a student, and one of his five things was a doctor. That he wanted to be a doctor. And so I was like, so is that, is that interesting? He goes, oh, yeah, very much so. I, I would like to be a doctor. And I go, okay, so you're, 
you're willing to go to school for like eight, ten years and do all that. And he goes, oh, no, I don't, I don't like school. I was like, okay, um, well, are there, are there any of these other ones that interest you? Yeah, I want to be a doctor. Okay, so, so the school thing, no, no, I don't, not, not really. He's like, well, first of all, I'm never going to you ever <laughs> if that works out for you because that terrifies me. Um, but what he was saying is he had a desire to do something, but he didn't want to take the necessary steps in order to do that. And so I, I've realized that that question, while it's a decent question, do you want to make an impact, it's actually the incorrect question. Um, this is the more important question for us to ask. Are you willing to pay the price to make an impact? Because in order to make an impact, there is a cost that you have to take on in order to do that. Um, and let me show you, I, I'll talk about me for a second and then we'll apply this back to you. Um, this is how I used to view how leadership worked. Um, and if I could explain this real quick, I've, I thought that leaders, they had tons of freedom and very little responsibility. Um, because I'd look at the church and there was always the guy who was in charge. And so I go, okay, I, I watch him, he gets up, he talks for like 30 minutes a week, he tells people what to do, he makes a few decisions, and then he does whatever he wants. And I thought, who wouldn't want to be that person? Like, I prefer telling people what to do than being told what to do. I prefer making decisions than have other people make decisions for me, and I like to do what I want. And so I thought, this is fantastic. This is what I want to do. And then I realized it's actually, I have my triangle upside down. This is how it looks like more so. That if you're going to race, if you're going to be a leader, you have less freedom and a lot more responsibility. Um, let me explain this just for me right now. You have an enormous amount of freedom to do things that I cannot do. I don't have the freedoms that you have. If I could just give you a very easy example of this. You have, I'm not saying this is a good thing, but you have the freedom to label people and give up on them. Like if you've been burnt, or if someone treats you negatively, or you ask someone to do something and they failed, you have the freedom to go, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really going to do anything with them. I'm going to kind of be done with them. And, and you probably have a few people in your life who you've done that to. Who you're just kind of, things went bad, something like that, and so you're just kind of done. I don't have that freedom. Because I have to believe the best in people, and I have to believe that God is continually working on people. And so I'm not saying that you doing that is necessarily a positive thing, but I'm saying that I don't have the freedom to do that. And so with that, my responsibility has increased and my freedom has decreased. And so the issue is of what we're looking at, it's not do you want to make an impact. The question is, are you willing to make a trade? Are you willing to trade your freedom for added responsibility. Not just do I want to, not just do I have a desire to, to see the world be a better place. Am I willing to actually make a trade? Because leadership is all about making trades. Am I willing to trade some of my freedom or a lot of my freedom for added responsibility? And, and this is what I know about you. This is how you got to where you are today. Because you have made this trade many different times. You've made this trade throughout school. You've made this trade in your job. You've made this trade in your family. Oh my goodness. There is no one who you can impact more in your life who you have more influence over than your own child. A lot of freedom there, right? No. But a massive amount of responsibility. And so when you put yourself in that arena where you can have influence, you automatically in that moment make a trade. You can't go out and do stuff. You can't go to certain places. Um, we're at the awful spot right now in our lives. And, and for those of you who know me well, you'll know how painful this is. Where eating out is a chore. And you need to understand, I love eating out. Like, eating out is the greatest thing in the world to me. Um, because of this, not just the food. I like the fact that when I am done with my food, I get up and I just go away. <laughs> and that's it. I mean, that's my favorite part. Um, People would always complain, the college that we were at, they would always complain the cafeteria, it's awful, it's disgusting. They're like, it doesn't matter. You get a tray, 
And then when you're done, you just put the tray on a little thing, and it goes. And it like kind of went down a chute, and I don't really know where it went, but I didn't have to worry about where it went. But now that we have kids, we've lost that freedom because they yell, and they get up, and they run, and they spill stuff, and it's, it's not so much fun. You don't want to eat out with us is basically what I'm telling you. <laughs> now, if I invite you, so I'm like, I don't know about this. But the key thing is, is that we understand that intuitively in certain arenas. And you know that that's how you've gotten to where you are. Because you've made that trade. You have. You've made that trade, whether um, it's a sport. Oh my goodness. If you play a sport, even at younger ages now, you trade a massive amount of freedom for the responsibility of being on that team. And I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing. You understand that in your job, and you're willing to pay the price. But then this is what happens. Whatever arena of our life that that's in, over time, we're no longer as excited to make that trade. I mean, as time goes on, early on, we're like, good to go. We're go. oh yeah, I want that responsibility. I'll make that sacrifice. I'll pay that price. I'll give up those freedoms so I can have this, so I can be a part of this group or be a part of this team or make this impact or have this job. And then we get to a spot in our life where that becomes a little more strained. It becomes a little more difficult. We no longer want to make that trade maybe as willingly. We're no longer as excited to go, yeah, I'll give up more of my freedom, right? I mean, it kind of becomes labored. And what happens is, is we begin worrying more, we begin becoming more concerned about my rights and my freedoms than the impact that I'm making. I become, begin becoming far more concerned in terms of how this affects me instead of what I can do because of what I'm sacrificing. What I've just described, even though it doesn't sound that bad in that moment, is what we refer to as entitlement. Um, this is the definition of entitlement. Belief that one is deserving of certain privileges. The belief that one is deserving of certain privileges. And this is what I know about you. And I know this about you because it's true of me too. We love to talk about other people who are entitled, right? I mean, if you're having a conversation with someone and it's kind of labored and they're just like not good at the back and forth and maybe you don't know each other that well, just do one simple thing. So who do you think is entitled? And it may feel awkward at first. So who do you think is entitled? I promise you they will be able to go on for hours because we all believe that other people are entitled. We do. And it usually comes off in two different groups. If you're older, you believe people younger than you are entitled. If you're younger, you believe people older than you are entitled. And if you work hard, you believe people who don't work as hard as you are entitled, right? I think that covers just about every group right there. Because the younger people go, oh, well, that's how they've always done it, and so they're not willing to give that up. Older people go, well, they don't know what it's like to work hard. They've never been there before, and so they don't deserve that. But what happens throughout all of this is we begin worrying about our own privileges and our own rights. And that's really hard. We like talking about other people who are entitled, but I think we could grasp maybe there is a little bit of entitlement in us. When certain opportunities to sacrifice, to trade freedom for responsibility come up, after a while we become a little shaky. We're not nearly as excited to do that. And this is why this matters. This is why this is so incredibly important. Because if you are entitled, you will not make an impact. And I promise you that. If you are entitled, if you are more worried about your rights and your privileges and what you deserve, then you will do nothing. Well, I, this is a little strong. The only thing that you will do are things that benefit you. And you'll be willing to make sacrifices as long as you get the return on that and as long as it all comes back to you. And so what we see inherently is that entitlement is the enemy of making an impact. Now this is what I want to look at this morning. I want to look at a passage um, of Jesus' teaching and some of the things that he does 
where he is going to show us two things. He's going to show us what the opposite of entitlement is, and it's not not entitlement, just in case if that's what you were wondering. He's going to show us what the opposite of entitlement is, and he's going to show us how you protect against it. And it's incredible what he teaches. Um, if I could be very clear, it's quite in your face. And so if you came in this morning feeling like really good and happy about yourself, uh, I'm sorry, but you're probably not going to leave feeling quite as good and happy about yourself. We're an encouraging church. Go ahead and pat someone on the back right now just to make sure they get in that encouragement right now. Thank you for the three of you who did that. I appreciate that. So, if you have your Bibles this morning, um, if you will open them up to Mark chapter 10, and we're going to look at 13 verses today. Mark chapter 10, and we're going to start in verse 32. Um, I highly encourage you, whether you have your Bible in paper or on your phone, to actually follow along with that this morning, because we're going to cover a lot of verses, and I promise you it will be far easier to look at it in your lap than to kind of try to keep looking up at the screen and going through that. So I'm going to give you one second to get there. And here we go. Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 32. And it says this. They, referring to Jesus and the people who were following him, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. And we go, okay, so why were they astonished and afraid? Well, what happens right before this is Jesus has an encounter with a guy who's young, who's very rich, and he basically tells him the high cost that it takes to follow him. And he ends that whole teaching with, but many who are first will be last in the last first. And we go, what does that mean? The first will be last and the last will be first. I mean, th that sounds a lot like everybody who participates gets a trophy, which I don't really like. But, and so he's going along, and so they're just, they're just kind of confused as to what's happening, and he's going to explain it. So they were astonished and afraid. Again, he took the 12 aside, his closest followers, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. He says this, We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man, referring to himself, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. So he basically says, hey, um, if you're confused as to what's going on, this, this is what's going to happen. Um, we're going up. They're going to take me. They're going to beat me. They're going to crucify me. They're going to put me in a tomb. And three days later, I'm going to arise again. This is, um, like, you have awkward conversation moments with people around you where, like, um, maybe you have a, a friend in your group who's kind of the Debbie Downer. They're like, all of a sudden, they'll just always say something very depressing. And so you're just trying to figure out, like, how you recover from that. It's like, so the weather is nice. And like that's, that's kind of the feeling that I'm getting here, that it's like they're going along, things are, people are interested, and he goes, oh yeah, hey, hang on, um, they're going to kill me, but I'm coming back, so don't worry too much. And they're like, oh, okay. And, and that's important that you feel that because of what happens next. It says, then, verse 35, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, like, like right after, then, Immediately after he says that, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. That sounds appropriate, doesn't it? <laughs> like, oh, they're going to kill me. Hey, uh, Jesus, um, since they're going to kill you and you're going to be gone soon, uh, could you do me a favor? <laughs> like, <laughs> what? <laughs> like, this is, this is not the time. And then I really like this. Because um, it shows me that me and Jesus have uh, at least something in common. I hope more in common than just this. But this is how he answers. He says, what do you want me to do for you? He asks. He doesn't say yes. And this is, this is a complete aside to the sermon. But I hate it when people say, hey, Kevin, I need a favor. And this is how I never say, yeah, sure. 
Just tell me what it is. Because this is what I don't know. I don't know if your definition of a favor is the same as my definition of a favor. Like, favor is like, will you get my mail while I'm on vacation? Will you let my dog out? Like, I don't want to go, yes, and you go, could I have a kidney? And like, I already said, yes. Like, I don't want to get locked in on that. And so I get very nervous there. So they kind of go, hey, Jesus, would you do us a favor? And he goes, well, why don't you, why don't you go ahead and tell me what it is before I say anything? And then they say this. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. So we go, now? This is what you're asking this? He just said he's going to die. And they go, hey, we know that you're powerful and when you're kind of famous and everything like that, could we kind of be at your right and left that you're, we're kind of your guys? Like, this is, this is the equivalent of what that is. Only tenfold. It's like you're going out to get your mail in the morning, and you, you see your neighbor. Hey, Bill. Hey, how are you? I'm doing good. How about you, Bill? Oh, I lost my job. Well, Bill, since you have extra time, could you cut my grass? Like, like that's kind of what's going on here, only quite a bit more. And so they go, hey, uh, could we be at your right and left? Since you're going to die, but you're going to come back, which is do that, can we be at your right and left? And this is what Jesus says. This is so important. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. And he says, can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? This is what he says, even though it sounds kind of confusing. He says, are you willing to pay the price? He, he doesn't ask... Oh, are, are you sure that's what you want? He says, yeah, I understand. That's your desire. I, I understand you want to do that. Are you willing to do what it takes to do that? And then they're, they're so dumb. Oh, my goodness. They're so dumb. They just go, we can, they answered. Like, they have no idea really what he's saying. But they go, yeah, sure. That, this looks good. It looks like we're going to get what we want. So we can. And then Jesus says this. He says, Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Um, this is what we know. James and John did pay that price. Uh, I, I don't know if it's because they agreed to it here or if that was already in their future. Um, we know John, even though he died of old age, um, they tried to boil him alive and it didn't work. And so they exiled him on an island by himself. I, I don't think the boiled alive part would be that fun, especially when it doesn't work. Um, we know James, they killed him, that they beat his head in with a club. Like, that's, that's comforting, right? And he goes, you will pay that price. But he said, this isn't for me to grant. And then this is important. Um, it's, well, sorry, let me get this first. I love this. It says, when the ten heard about this, the other ten who were his closest followers, when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. When they heard James and John ask this right after he said he was going to die, they were furious with them. You know why? It's not because it was socially inappropriate. They were mad because they didn't think of it first. <laughs> like, right? <laughs> They're going, Wish, I'm so mad at them. Why could they... I wish I would have thought of that. And then Jesus does something. Um, this has all been set up to what he says here at the end. What he says here at the end is so important. Um, and let me tell you this, uh, because I, I forgot to say this before. If you are responsible for anyone, these next three verses, you need to write them on a note card. You to, need to set them as the lock screen on your phone. You need to put them in a spot where you see it over and over again. And I'm very, very serious about it. If you don't, like, if scripture memorization is nowhere in your history, if you have no idea what I'm even talking about when I say memorizing scripture, I'd say these, these are the three verses that you must keep in front of you. If you are a manager, if you are the boss of someone, if you are a parent, these need to be front and center because what he says here is so counterintuitive to absolutely everything else that we hear. It says this. It says, Jesus called them together and said, You know. Say, we know. He's saying, like, this is obvious. This is how the world works. It doesn't take a genius to observe this. You know 
that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, he's just saying the people in the world, those who are regarded as rulers, lord it over them. He's saying those who are the rulers, they let people know that they're the rulers. It's very obvious. And then he says it the second time. He says, and their high officials exercise authority over them. He's saying if you're the boss, you let everyone know that you're the boss. If you're in charge, you want everyone to know that you're in charge. Uh, I, I'm not saying that what he's saying here, he goes, you know, it, just this is how it works. Um, we see examples of this. My mom always told me this over and over again. This is not necessarily a bad thing, but she said, this is my house. As long as you live in my house, you will abide by my rules, right? How many of you just, okay, can we do the thing again? There we go. How many of you, your mom said that to you? And how many of you have now said it to your kids? There we go. That's just fantastic. Isn't that, isn't that fun? But he's saying, I'm not saying that's a bad thing in that specific instance, because it's important that people do understand who's in charge. But he's saying that you know usually how it works, that those who are in charge use their authority, use their power to let other people know that they are in charge. Um, I had, when I was in seventh grade, I had a terrible, terrible basketball coach. Just, a, just an absolutely awful basketball coach. And I, I can still remember so many of the practices and things like that. Um, I feel like he watched too many like inspirational basketball movies. And so he tried to do like those things without actually caring about us. I couldn't quite put that into words then. I'm glad I didn't because I would have had to run more. <laughs> like, well, you're just trying to be like so-and-so, but you don't really care about us. Ugh. But I remember like over and over again, um, we would just have things come up and he would just run, run. And I can remember one time we were running and we were doing suicides, which I don't think they do now because or they don't call them suicides, which is, that's probably a good thing that you tell a bunch of seventh graders, go do 10 suicides, which <laughs> we're progressing as a society. Um, but we're doing the suicides and I can remember um, the head coach of like the head varsity coach came up and he was kind of walked, watching our practice and he was just yelling at us. And the head coach comes up to him, and I, this is crazy that I remember this, but it's amazing how this stuff sticks with you. Uh, he comes up to him, and he goes, uh, why are they running so much? And my coach said, because I can. <laughs> and I'm running. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> talk about a loss of motivation in the moment. Like, well, this... This sting, I don't want to run anymore. <laughs> like, I understood we ran when we were in trouble or we ran when we were lazy. He was saying, because I can't. And he goes, this is how it works. Um, you do this. I, I do this. Uh, we always want to point to the other people who do this. Like, oh yeah, this is, when he's saying exercise authority, he's talking about my boss or the person who's in charge of me. We do this. Right? We do this. And then Jesus says this. Verse 43. Not so with you. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And we go, ooh, I don't like that. Like, I am okay serving, but I don't like to be viewed as a servant, if that makes sense. Like, I'll serve when I want to serve. If I don't want to, I don't want to have to. I just want to do it when I want to and then kind of come out and do different things. And he goes, no, no, no. Whoever wants to be great must be your servant. Now, if that doesn't bother you, this is how he says it next. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. I, I don't think anyone's going to sign up for that, right? Like we'll go, hey, we're going to do this and we're going to help that. And we go, okay, we're going to have sign-ups this morning. Um, does anyone want to be slave of all? Nope. Okay, moving on. Like, but this is what he says. He says, if you want to be first, if you want to do something great, then you must be the servant. You must be slave 
of all. Now, now to be very clear, um, when we're talking about slave here, I mean, that context is you are physical property of someone else. I don't think he's saying you actually need to become physical property of everyone. He's saying that this is your attitude. This is how you view yourself. I'm not better than them. I'm not above them. I can serve them. What he's describing right here is humility. That you don't view yourself as better than others. You don't view yourself as above others. And then this is what we do. And I just want to be very, very clear on this. We don't actually say that. We don't say, I'm better than them. We say, because I've done this and this and this, then that's why I shouldn't have to serve. Because I've done this in the past, that's why I shouldn't be here. Because this has occurred, and I've made this sacrifice, then I shouldn't need to engage in that. And we start to think that that is beneath us. But what he's describing here is humility. I'm not, I'm not better than them. I'm not above them. I'm a servant. And then if that bothers you, if you're going, oh, I don't like that, you won't like what he says next. He says, for even the Son of Man, referring to himself, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And this is what you're saying if you're unwilling to, to put yourself in that position. If you go, oh, that sounds like a nice teaching, but I'm not really going to apply it. If that sounds like a good thing, but I'm not really going to serve, what you're saying is, I'm better than Jesus. Right? There's no other way to take that. If you look at that and you go, okay, that sounds hard, servant, slave of all, humility, I mean, that, that's nice in concept, but, but Kevin, you don't understand the people who work for me. You don't understand my kids. I can't serve. I can't do that. What you're saying in that moment is, um, it, it goes like this. Uh, my people, Jesus, me. And that's the order. He says, no, no, no. Even, even me, even Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve. I tell you, aren't you glad he did Aren't you glad that he was willing to give his life as an act of service for you? And this is what happened. When he did, it changed everything. It changed absolutely everything. Because he traded his freedom, his rights, for the responsibility of your sins. And that's how he made an impact. And so in order to make an impact, you have to to be humble. And what we see here right in this moment is that humility is the opposite of entitlement. That for people who are entitled, people who are worried about their rights and their privileges, not just people outside world, people us here. That when we're worried about our rights and privileges, we are not humble. That humility is as far from entitlement as you can possibly get. Um, this has gotten a little heavy, and we've got one more important thing to cover right here on this. I want to share with you a funny story, just so I don't forget this. Um, uh, me and Bethany, we were in Ikea a couple weeks ago. Um, which you've ne If you've never been to Ikea, um, if you love furniture, it's heaven. If you don't love furniture, you know what it is. <laughs> um, me, not so much the lovey furniture kind of guy. Um, it takes you like two hours to get through, and you walk through so much furniture that when you finally get to the end, it's two stories, and there's, there's no getting out of it. It's like a maze. You just get lost in beds and chest of drawers and bookshelves. That by the time you finally get to the end, you are willing to buy anything just to get out of that door. Like, I mean, and they have all the cheap stuff at the end. So you're like, a glass. Yes, I need a glass. I feel like I should buy a glass. I've seen hundreds of thousand dollars worth of stuff. I, I bought four packs of batteries. I don't need batteries. So I was like, I just... I need to get something. I feel obligated at this point in time. Um, so we're at Ikea, and there's a couple, about 23, 24, and they're about to have a fight. It's like, yes! <laughs> like, I was excited. Um, I don't like fighting. I don't like it when my friends fight, but I like being witness to public places when strangers fight. I think that's, I think that's fun, particularly couples. 
And so there's a couple there, 23, 24, and like I walk into the room with a bunch of beds and stuff like that, and I could tell there was, there was a, about to be a fight because they're like looking at each other, and there's this strange tension, and I'm like, I've got my cart, and I'm like, oh yeah, buddy, here we go. <laughs> and, um, and the guy standing there talking to his girlfriend, and then he turns to walk away, and as he's walking away, he says very, very loudly, I can afford it. So I'm there, I'm like, yes, this is great. So he's like, I can afford it. And then he turns back and looks at her and goes, I work 30 hours a week. <laughs> and I was like, we are following them until they leave. And, uh, and nothing ended up happening. There was like just this awkward tension. They didn't look at each other and they just kind of had their heads down. I was like, which kind of made me sad because um, I wanted more. That was exciting. But I thought, I thought that was hilarious right there in that moment. I mean, what a, I deserve this cheap, clunky furniture, which, no offense, we have lots of Ikea furniture, so I'm not judging you because it's all over our house. I deserve this cheap, clunky furniture because I work 30 hours a week. I was like, bravo, man. This is, this is the pinnacle of your existence right here. I deserve this. 30 hours. Work hard. Um, now we got to come back. I just really didn't want to miss that story. Humility is the opposite <laughs> of entitlements. And then this is how you get there. This is, the, this is the really hard part. You must be humble to serve, and serving makes you humble. You must be humble to serve, but serving makes you humble. They go, okay, so, so how do I have a desire to serve? Well, you have to serve. But I don't have a desire to serve. We well, have to serve to get a desire to serve. But I want to be humble. We well, have to serve. But I don't want to serve because I'm not humble. We well, have to serve to be humble so you'll serve. And we go, what? <laughs> how, do I, how do I do that? H- here's the thing. You will not have a desire to serve until you start serving. Because serving breeds within you an attitude of humility which makes you want to serve more. This is so important. This is not just the secret, I want to be very clear, this is not the secret to being humble. This is the secret to making an impact. Because if you are entitled, you will not make an impact. You must be humble to make an impact. We've already covered that. But the way that you become humble is you serve. And and we go, okay, this is kind of like the whole chicken or the egg thing. Okay, so which come first? What do I do here? Well, one of them's a position of your heart, humility, which you can't control, and the other one's an action. You go, okay, so where do I start? Well, you can control your actions. And you start with serving. And that's how the world changes. When people serve, they become humble, they view themselves as servants, and they do the work that it takes to make an impact and to make a difference in the world. Now, that's the message. That's the whole thing. That's all I got. And we go, oh my goodness, there's still time left. He never ends early. Yeah, you're right, because we still have more to go. Uh, I have an ulterior motive this morning, and that is I have covered all that because I want you to serve in our church. I want you to use your skills, your talents, and your abilities in this church to make a difference and to make an impact. Um, When you came in, you should have gotten one of these. I need you to pull this out. If you do not have one of these, will you raise your hand highly? There we go. Bobby is delivering these. So raise your hand and keep it raised. Um, If you're stretching, this is a terrible time to be stretching, just to be clear. Uh, So just keep it up. Bobby will find you. Um, Here's the thing. I will come back to this in just a second. Okay, so some of you, you are like the super eager people who like in class, you've already done your homework before the teacher has assigned it. Please don't be that person this morning. I, I just need you to take it and we're going to do this. Ready? Ready? Put your, put your card in your right hand. There we go. I'm going to teach you something. Yeah, there we go. Put your card in your right hand. Uh, raise your left arm like a chicken wing and then just place it under there and now you can't see it. And so when you give these back to us, they will smell wonderful, but I want you to keep it right there for the next little bit. First, I want to explain to you very, very quickly why I believe that you should serve in the church as opposed to maybe some other places. I believe to the core of my being that every problem in the world is a spiritual problem. 
I believe that every problem that we face in the world is at the core a spiritual problem. And you don't need much verification to know that there are problems in the world. Turn on the 7 o'clock, the 9 o'clock, the 12, the 5, or the 11 o'clock news. Watch it for three minutes, and you will see that there are problems in the world. Now, here's the issue. Is the things that we go to for sources of healing fall short? One of the biggest problems that we have in our country right now is finances. Those problems are personal and national. We have individual people who have lots of financial problems, and as a nation, we have financial problems. Here's the problem with our solution. We usually teach people good financial practices and how to set a budget, and we think that that is the cure-all for financial problems. You know why people get into financial problems? Because we're greedy. Not because we're dumb, and that's very important. We get into financial problems because we're greedy. And if you solve it with budgets and financial practices, you never address the greed issues that cause those problems to begin with. Another big problem that we have in our nation is lying. I mean, politician has kind of become synonymous with lying. Um, I'm reading a book right now that's very interesting. It's called The President's Club. And I just finished about 150 pages on Richard Nixon and everything that he went through, which in those 150 pages, there was quite a bit of lying that occurred. But this is how we teach people not to lie. And parents, if we have kids, this is how we teach them not to lie. Lying is bad. Lying will get you in trouble, and you shouldn't lie because it will be found out. Now, does lying always get found out? No. No, it doesn't. I mean, you've told lies that haven't been found out. I'm really glad this didn't happen because I said this in the 915 service. Of, Does lying always get found out? And there was like a second grade boy who's like, yes! <laughs> and I was like, yeah, for you, <laughs> you need to remember it does. <laughs> Everyone else, we know we're saying, no, lying doesn't get found out. It doesn't, every time. Lying is bad, but we'll teach people that. And then you know what happens is we'll teach people that, that you shouldn't lie, and yet we'll keep, we'll lie when it will get us ahead. We'll lie when we think it'll advance us and it won't get found out. That's how our society works. That's how people are made up. And the only way you get someone to keep from lying is you get them to understand that there is a power and authority greater than them outside of them that they should subscribe to, that they should live their life by. And so outside of faith, not lying doesn't make sense. And so we go to all these different things for our sources of healing, and they don't work, and they fall short over and over again. And this is what I believe. If you fix the spiritual problem with the world, you will at the same time fix the problem of what happens to me when I die, which is a great issue that people struggle with. And so you give them that hope. If you fix the spiritual problem, you fix the eternity problem, and at the exact same time, you fix the problems in the world. At the core, every problem that we struggle with in our nation and in our world is a spiritual problem. And if we fix the spiritual problem, we fix the eternity problem, and we also fix the problems in the world. And we go, okay, so Kevin, if that's true, then why isn't our world a better place? And Jesus said it very simply. This is Matthew 9:37. The harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. The harvest is plenty. He says the world's ripe. It's ready to go. But he says we don't have enough hands to do the work. And that's why more isn't happening. And so this is what I'm asking this morning. I am asking you to make a trade. I am asking you to trade some of your freedom for responsibility. I am asking you to trade some of your time and some of your energy to make an impact. Now, if you have your card, let me walk you through this real quickly. So, go ahead. Outside the armpit, you can pull it out for those of you who kept it there the entire time. Congratulations, great is your reward in heaven. <laughs> um, if I could just explain these couple different things. Um, Kid XP. Kid XP is what happens Sunday morning back there. In the fall. Oh, sorry, I, I want to give a, a side note to this. Everything that we're talking about here. Um, these are things that will then take shape in the fall. So you don't have to worry. So don't worry about like signing and being like, but I'm going to be on vacation next week. I mean, it's either going to be summer or fall coming in there. 
And so Kid XP is what happens Sunday mornings at 9.15 and 10.45. What we are asking you to do if you want to be a part of that is to trade three hours of your week, three hours, because we ask you to come to a service as well, three hours of your week to be the foundation in a kid's life. Three hours to be the foundation in a kid's life. Um, we don't have, we have many people who are teachers throughout the week in our Kid XP program, and they do a wonderful job. They are absolutely fantastic. You don't need to be a teacher to be back there. This is, we need you to do one thing. Like kids. If your internal nature is to punch kids, <laughs> then we do not want you back there. Okay? If that is not your desire, if you see like a three-year-old and you want to hug them, and not chop them in the throat, then Kid XP may be for you. We'll give you all the tools and training that you need after that. Um, <laughs> sometimes I hear what you hear. Most of the time it just goes through and I go, what on earth? Um, student takeover. Student takeover is what occurs Sunday nights in our student ministry. We're asking you to take two hours a week to be, to be a group leader for students. A group leader, this is what a group leader is. Okay, it's so... You sit in a circle. So how are we doing? Doing good? And then you go, well, I, I love, my favorite moment in my entire life is, where is he? Tim Sargent. I got to watch Tim Sargent lead his small group of junior high boys. So what did you guys think about this message? Well, I got a new game, Call of Duty, this week. It was really good, and I was shooting guys, and they had zombie level, and it was so good. Yeah, okay. So what would you guys think of the message? The other day in school, we were playing kickball, and we kicked it, and it kicked it far, and it was good, and I ran the bases, and then I got hit at the very end. Said, okay, but this is what happens. Those kids know that Tim cares about them, and that is so significant. That is so important. And so in Student Takeover, we're asking you to take two hours a week to be the adult for students in the most pivotal part of their life. To be the adult for students in the most pivotal part of their life. Um, groups is uh, what we do. We don't do Sunday school as a church. We meet in homes throughout the week. In groups, we need you to be able to open your home or find someone who can open their home and just talk to people. Um, if you like people, you're a good groups person. Um, Kid Stuff is the event that happens once a month on Sunday nights where we introduce the virtue um, that, uh, that the kids will learn the rest of the week back in Kid XP. Set up, we need you to give an hour, maybe two, once a month to set up chairs and to make sure that this is a place that people can come here on Sunday mornings and worship God and find what his purpose is for their life. Uh, the media team is all that stuff that happens back there that they don't ever let me touch. And so if you feel like you're qualified to touch that stuff or you want to touch that stuff, if they'll train you, because um, they don't let me do that, then you can do that. And it's also all our web stuff. If you like spending time on computers, that's for you. Our host team are all the people who wear those navy blue shirts and do a great job. Um, if you can do this, I'm not trying to minimize what you host team people do, because I, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> that's, that's gonna, if you can do this, ready? I, I, actually, we're going we're gonna to practice this together. You ready? Hi. There you go. Okay, there you go. You can do it. <laughs> you can do it. That's great. Now, they'll teach you a few more things after that, but if you can smile and say hi, those are pretty much the only requirements must that you have to be able to do for the host team. And then creative arts, these are the kind of drama, artsy people, things that um, they don't let me do anymore either because I'm not good at them, um, things that we do to make our Sunday services great. So this is what I need you to do right now. Okay, so hear me on this. I need you to look at these... See where you fit in. I'm going to give you a chance in just a second. Um, there are some pens under chairs. Uh, we don't have a pen for every chair. We trust that because we're in church that you can actually share with each other. So I hope that you can share with each other. Uh, we want you to mark a couple of these. And what's going to happen from here, just to be very clear on this, when we get done with these and you fill out your information, we want you to drop them in Tom on the way out. Okay, that's kind of how we're going to collect them. Within the next two weeks... For the areas that you signed up on, our leader in that area will contact you and give you a date that that group is going to meet together where you can find out more information. This is the most important thing. Because you are checking this box does not commit you to doing that. You are simply saying, I might kind of possibly be interested in finding out what this is all about. If you check this box, we will not hunt you down and drag you out of your house 
to make sure that you are serving there. We will simply give you an opportunity to find out more what's going on. And then here's the beautiful thing. You may get there and you may go, you know what? I'm just not that good at this. And you know what we're going to tell you? Then find another spot. Because if you're not good at it, this may sound mean, we don't want you there. Because we believe that you're good at something. And so if you're serving somewhere that you're not good at, there's another spot that, is, that needs you because you're actually talented there. And so I want you to fill it out, check a few boxes. We will contact you within two weeks and give you some follow-up information. While you're filling this out, and if you need to talk to someone, hey, what do you think about this? Have you heard about this? Is this good? The conversations that you're already having right now without me giving you permission to, that's great. Um, we want to show you a video of some of our students and why they serve. Now, I want to be clear on this video. Uh, this video was taken at 7 o'clock in the morning. A number of our students meet on a leadership team very early. It's in McDonald's, and so that's why it's a little loud and they look a little tired. But one of the things that I am most proud of as our church is that our students serve like crazy. Um, sometimes people will talk to me about different events or concerts or things like that, and like, well, you should bring your youth group here. Well, first of all, it's not my youth group. But then I'll always ask this next. Okay, when is the event? And a lot of times people say, well, they'll get back on Sunday afternoon, or they'll get back at this time. And I say, uh-uh, no way, because we need our students on Sunday morning. If they're not here on Sunday morning, we would just shut down. Because we would not know what to do because we use so many of them and they do so much. Um, I, I said this in 915. She's never around when I said this. I don't know how many of you know Allison Skaggs. Allison Skaggs is like third or fourth grade. I don't really know. They all kind of look alike within that age range. Um, but whenever anyone has questions on setup for the back hallway in Kid XP and they go, well, how does this go? I tell them, ask Allison. Don't ask me. I do not know. Ask Allison. She knows where everything goes. And they go and she tells them what to do. Now, she doesn't lord it over them like the Gentiles do, which is good. So, with all that said, while you're talking about that, can we go ahead and play that video? I'm Rachel, and I help with the Kid XP Tom class. And I'm Abby, and I help with the Kindergarten and First Grade class. Hi, I'm Morgan, and I serve in the area of worship. Um, my name's Jenna, and I serve in the area of Kid XP slash worship sometimes. I'm Justin Conrad, and I play the bass in the worship band. And I am Nathan Henderson, and I do the computer for student takeover and kid stuff, as well as run lights on Sunday mornings. Um, I just really like hanging out with little kids because I think that they're hilarious, first of all. Um, it's really important to me to help them get a good foundation of Christ in their life because I feel like that's going to take them a really long way. And I had really good Sunday school teachers when I was young, and they've, they kind of helped me become who I am today. Same thing here. Um, I just want the kids to know that they're loved and that we're here for them no matter what they do. And I just want them to have the same thing I had when I was little. I had good teachers and good like church family to support me, and they need that too. Uh, I think it's important to serve because uh, I like to see the impact that we can make on the teens, and I think it's important to, to learn now how to grow as we were teenagers. Um, I think it's important to serve in Kid XP because you're kind of with these kids as soon as they're starting out in their faith, and you kind of want to give them that strong, um, strong, it's like foundation. That's a strong foundation to start their faith on, and kind of so they can grow and become close to God as they get older and stay in the church, like so many people don't nowadays. I guess like it's fun. Happy birthday! And um, like. Maybe I can like motivate somebody to like do what I do because they get excited for what I do. So like, like, do you get anything out of, of playing? Like, like, I feel like it's. <laughs> Does it teach you to worship in any way? Like, I think it's more effective. Never, I have to like 
play the song and stuff. Um, I never really got involved in church until Brandon Conrad first introduced me to Crosspoint, and um, of course you all know that I love technology. Um, but I find it easier for myself to worship by getting involved with it and doing all of the tech stuff. Uh, and that sort of helps me out as well as when I, I'm doing that, but I know I'm spreading God's word through doing it. So, so it's sort of a win-win situation. I give up my sleep on Sunday morning. I wake up at 8 on a Sunday morning. Most of my friends probably think that that's crazy, but I feel like I get to go and hear an awesome sermon first thing and then go help kids have a relationship with God, and I can't think of a better way to spend my Sunday morning. I sacrifice a lot of time and energy because I have to be at the church at probably 3 every Sunday and I have to dedicate a lot during the week to text everybody and remind them and practice and I think it's important because in the end that's what everybody looks forward to at youth group. We always have worship and I think it makes a big impact because everyone needs to learn how to worship. Um, I sacrifice a ton of energy because kids are very hyper and they're very sometimes kind of frustrating but honestly it's all to serve God and it makes me feel really good and for some reason my energy never really runs out with it so it's good. Time. A lot of time. Why do you sacrifice and you sacrifice that because? Uh, I like doing it. Uh, for the tech aspect of it, but um, it's also making me a better person and helping me um, follow Christ um, and become a better person. Did uh... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, do that. Okay, uh, two things, two things real, real quickly. Um, in between services, uh, an awesome thing happened that uh, has been going on for a while that I wasn't aware of. Um, there's a guy who's a uh, high school teacher who has been coming to our church for a little while, um, a little sporadically, and uh, he was talking to Bobby, and he was just talking about how, um, how he's been coming, and his students who come to our church will often talk to him about church. And then his students started talking to him about where he was going to serve and how he was going to serve. Uh, what had happened is that for our young people, serving is not optional, it's a given. This is what I do. If I'm a part of this church, then I serve. And that is incredible. I can't even begin to tell you how absolutely amazing that is, and so that excites me. Um, and then I'm going to give you one more thing. Um, I, I've told this story, some of you may have heard this story before. Uh, when I was younger, I grew up in a Sunday school model in church that we had Sunday school, and uh, I was in a class in a fifth and sixth grade class. My Sunday school teachers were Dick and Jeanetta Ponchot. We had Sunday school at 9.15, then we went to church service at 10.45. And they started something new. Sunday school lasted for about an hour. They started something new that they wanted us to start teaching the lesson with them. And so they set up a rotation that in every year, one of us, or we would each get a chance to teach the lesson once. And how it worked, if you got picked to teach the lesson that week, they would pick you up at 8 o'clock from your house, take you to Bob Evans, buy you breakfast, and then work through the lesson with you and show you what you were supposed to teach. Up until that point in time, the only thing I had ever been asked to do in church was move chairs. Now, let's be clear. I was awesome at moving chairs. Like, I had gotten really, really good at moving chairs. But that was the first time anyone ever kind of extended that other side to me. Hey, maybe you should try this. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And, and within me, at, at that age, I can still remember, within me, I, I kind of, I, I didn't know this is what I wanted to do, but I kind of had a, oh, maybe, maybe this is an option. Kind of a path was open before me. And this is what you need to hear. They paid maybe $6 for my breakfast and spent two hours with me. And that changed everything for me. $6 and two hours changed everything for me. Now, there's many other people who came in my life who made an impact, but it started there. And the thing is, if you ask them, I bet you they wouldn't even remember it. Um, they may remember, the only thing, other thing I remember from that is I spilled chocolate milk all over my shirt. 
And so I taught the lesson with like a big chocolate milk stain in this area. So they may remember that. But for me, $6 in two hours changed everything. And I want you to be that person in someone else's life. I want to use your skills and your abilities and your God-given gifts. And I want you to trade a little bit of freedom to make an impact. I want you to trade a little bit of convenience to make a difference in someone's life. And then here's the cool thing. Maybe, maybe 20, 30 years from now, there's going to be someone up on a stage somewhere telling the exact same story about you. And that's my hope for you. Let me pray. Father, as we gather here this morning, I want to pray for the person... Um, who as they went to check the boxes on their card that their pen was trembling. And all the fears and doubts came into their life of, what if I can't do this? What if I can't commit to this? What if this comes up? What if this happens? And God, I pray that in this moment you will help each person understand that you have a plan for them. That your plan for them is not just for them to coast through life and do nothing, but you have a plan for them to make an impact, to make a difference to be someone significant in someone else's life and that your plan is for them to use what they're good at to help point people to you. And Father, I pray that in this moment that trade would be very, very clear to us that we're not just inconveniencing ourselves. We're not just losing a little bit of sleep, a little bit of time, and a little bit of energy. But we are making a trade. We are deliberately, we are purposefully putting ourselves in a position of service to change the world. And let that not be lost on us. Let that not be lost on us when it's opening doors and setting up chairs and wiping kids' noses and playing dodgeball with students and doing all those other things. Let it not be lost on us, the magnitude of what we're really engaged in. And I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Hey, thank you. If you need another minute to fill out the card, please do so. Otherwise, drop them in, Tom, on the way out. You are dismissed. We'll see you back here next week for part four.